the, uh, the final moments of Christ's life on earth were quite tragic. Uh, his friend uh, betrayed him, Judas. One of Jesus' own followers, Judas Iscariot, betrayed Jesus uh, for the sum of 30 pieces of silver. It's amazing to think that Zechariah had predicted precisely that it would be 30 pieces of silver, and that's exactly what Judas received for betraying Christ. He uh, regretted his bargain rather immediately and tried to give the money back, uh, and then went out and killed himself. So keep in mind that the prophecy says that in AD 31, that the Messiah would be cut off or he would be crucified. So Jesus, knowing this, understood that his life would be a mechanism that would offer salvation to the world. Therefore, he was willing to do anything to accomplish his mission. He was beaten a number of times uh, as much as possible that was legal without actually killing somebody. As with skin being torn out of his, his body with each whip. Then after this, uh, he had to carry his cross, but that didn't last because uh, he was already, I'm sure he had a lot of blood loss because of the uh, scourging. Crucifixion inflicted by the Romans was the most horrible punishment that anybody could go through at the time. It was a type of torture that is to bring death, but a slow death. People were impaled on a cross or on a pole. They were, nails were put through their hands and through their feet. The feet would have been placed together. The nail would have gone one single nail through both feet, nailing those feet to the cross. And the individual then, as he hung on the cross, would have to lift himself up every single time he breathed on those feet in order to allow his diaphragm to expand. Also, their blood would be actually burning inside him like a burning sensation because of the effect that crucifixion would have on the body. So it was torture in several different stages, and it was completely awful. It was the suffocating. It was the blood hurting. It was the thirst that they were feeling, and it was meant to be exactly that torture, and then eventually death. Jesus' death, of course, was not a death forced by the crucifixion. It was not a death of suffocation after days and days of, of, of hanging there on the cross. It was not a death of lack of loss of blood. Um, it was not a death because of the physical suffering that Jesus experienced. The, the way he died was not simply uh, because of the physical pain, but uh, because of a broken heart. Broken heart syndrome is a, um, it's a medical entity where the heart actually um, undergoes so much stress that uh, it looks like the person is having a heart attack. There can be absolutely no physical obstruction in someone's heart arteries, but it is the intense stress levels that can actually cause the body to respond in such a way that there is uh, a physical abnormality uh, such as this broken heart syndrome. The emotional pain was tremendous, the pressure, because if he would give in, the plan of salvation would not be realized. Broken heart syndrome is also known by the name Takasubu's disease. And Takasubu is actually a, a, an octopus type trap. And the shape of this trap is what the heart looks like when it is undergoing its damage. The, the patients who have this stress-induced cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome, you, these happen in patients who are undergoing an intense amount of stress. This is not a stress that is minor. So Jesus, while dying on the cross, uh, had all of the guilt and all of the sins of everyone in this world on his shoulders and the amount of mental anguish that he was undergoing could definitely have caused this broken heart syndrome and um, the chemical levels again in the body with that amount of emotional stress would have been enough to trigger something like this to happen. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all and so from that prediction, many hundreds of years before the crucifixion, 
we are told that Jesus' death would not be a result of all these physical things that happened, but a, a result of his separation from his father, but more importantly, the weight of the sin of the world that, that crushed his heart, crushed his, his being, that he paid for there at the cross. And even though he suffers this cutting off, because it wasn't for his own sin, he comes forth from the death from which there is no return to give us salvation and to give us hope. And this is an incredible thing. So the prophecy of Daniel 9, 27 says, in the middle of the week, he will cause the sacrifices and the offerings to cease. Well, when did that happen? Three and a half years after AD 27 brings us to the spring of AD 31, precisely when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus, about three and a half years later, in the middle of that last seven weeks of years, Jesus died. Did he bring the sacrifice and offering to an end? Depends what you mean. When a person had committed a sin, he was supposed to bring a sacrifice. Uh, various kinds of animals were committed for sacrifice. It was replacement, a substitution being offered for them. Jesus was the fulfillment of those sacrifices and symbols. And that's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so we don't go to a Hebrew sanctuary. We go in faith to the hill of Calvary there where the Son of God is dying in our behalf. And as the scripture says, God made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, so that the righteousness of God may be fulfilled in us. The death of Christ in the middle of the week, in the spring of AD 31, is uh, without a doubt the most significant, solid historical evidence that Jesus Christ is truly the savior of the world that was predicted. I mean, it's incredible to think that he died just on time, just the way the Bible described. I mean, a prophecy of Daniel hundreds of years earlier, written in the sixth century, predicting that precisely the event of Christ's death. This was in the middle of the final week of years, which is between 27 AD and 34 AD. Okay? What happened in 34 at the end of the 490 years? This was the time that you read about in Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen was a deacon who was filled by the Holy Spirit. He was doing evangelism. And there were those then who turned him in to the authorities. And he was arrested. He gave an incredible speech. And then he was stoned to death at the end of his time. The gospel was rejected by the leaders among the covenant people. And it was taken to the Gentiles by the Apostle Paul in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. According to Acts chapter 15, we see that the boundaries are broken down. Gentiles, other people like me, can come directly to Christ without having to become Jewish first. We can come to him. Jewish people can come to him. Hindus and Muslims and all different kinds of people, everybody can come to him directly as our Messiah. We can all be spiritual descendants of Abraham. You know, here is a prophecy, five, six hundred years before the event took place, and pointing out exactly the ministry of Christ, his death, the destruction of Jerusalem. It is incredible. Not only does the Bible tell us to the year when he would come and begin his ministry, it tells us where he would be born, the tribe from which he would come. This all adds up to something that cannot be manipulated. This had to be divine foreknowledge revealed and prophesied right here in Micah, in Daniel, and then the other prophecies pointing in the nature of what he was going to do, what he was going to accomplish, how he was going to die, all of these different kinds of things. It all comes together to indicate that God really knows what he he's doing. And we can have confidence that when he says that he's going to deliver us, that he can do that. But it's the resurrection which, in a sense, puts the seal on this and gives us powerful, powerful reasons for believing in the whole plan of salvation as revealed in the New Testament. It has been said that Jesus Christ was the greatest man in history. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. 
He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. As I think back on what helped me to become a Christian, it was Jesus Christ. And as I discovered these prophecies as a young person, 15 years of age, coming from a secular background, I was opening up the prophecies of Daniel, going to a Daniel seminar, and I discovered that Jesus had come on time, had died on time, and that now I was confronted with the evidence. What would I do with this Christ? It was proved beyond a shadow of a doubt for me that this Jesus had come. As I see those things fulfilled in history and even in the world today, I can be sure as a Christian that the Bible is the Word of God. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate, he wakes up on that morning and he has no clue, no clue whatsoever what he's going to face that day. And what he ends up encountering is the very face of Jesus Christ. Whether or not that's what he expected, that's what he got. It's the same with us. We wake up in the morning and we don't expect that today is the day I might find the evidence that would suggest that I need a savior and that Jesus Christ was truly the Messiah. Now I had to figure out what will be my response. And as I looked at that information, I said, if Jesus does exist, if he wants a relationship with me, then I need to, to find out more about it, to, to figure out what it is. And I think that nothing else is more important. It's the most important thing. Everyone owes it to themselves to study these things out, to scrutinize the scriptures for themselves. And so I began that process. And as I read into my Bible and I read the Gospels, the Bible came alive. And, and I discovered that relationship. My life has not been the same. Jesus is standing before Pilate. And the question that Pilate asks cynically is, what is truth? And surely this is one of the great ironies of history. Pilate says, what is truth? A better question would have been, who is the truth? Because the very one who in the sweep of human history claimed to be the very embodiment of truth was standing right there in his midst. And Pilate, because he was swayed by public opinion, he was a slave to public opinion, was unwilling to find out the answer. The question is, are we, unlike Pilate, willing to find out just what is the truth? is the truth. truth.